Hey folks, this is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, and today we're going to be talking about Matthew chapter 24, part 1. Now, I have planned this to be a series of messages on Matthew 24. I'm not going to make it super detailed like the commentators do, but I am going to provide enough so that you can have an idea of what's happening in our world today how to counteract it in your own spiritual life, and then also to have some concept of what's going to be going on in the future. These are Jesus' words. They are not mine. I am merely trying to interpret them, and I'm going to try to do so with a minimum of speculation. So hang on and let's go. So the plan that I have here is to teach Matthew chapter 24 and 25. These chapters detail the events of the end times and explain what happens immediately after the Lord's return. However, Matthew 24 has to be considered in the light of the final verses of Matthew 23 because the verses of Matthew 23 provide you some backlighting on Jesus' words in 24. And it's very important to have that information. So the plan I have in mind is to provide you with this information in digestible chunks, rather than setting before you a buffet of teaching of an hour that overfills you and makes you sick so that you don't get the information you just find it so detailed and so full as i've heard many sermons like this on these passages that you can't really digest them you can't understand them now these chapters are not that complicated if you read them with some care and don't go after some foolish speculation but because of their ties to many other passages in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, we have to proceed with all those in mind. For example, the first thing about this passage is that Jesus' opening statement about the end times follows right after his departure from the temple, which is recorded in Matthew 23. And this is one of those unfortunate instances where the chapter break kind of it makes us miss some important things. So <clears throat> Jesus says in Matthew 23, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, acknowledging him as Messiah. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. But Jesus said to them, Don't, Do you not see all these things? Verily, verily, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, folks, this is Jesus' statement about the temple and the, Jude and the Jewish religion and Judaism without him. The Jewish leaders have rejected him. Now he rejects them. And the most important concept here is this is exactly the same as God leaving the temple in Ezekiel. <clears throat> the son of the father has left the temple for the final time. What do you think that means? And the, the events future to everything, to everyone and everything in, in AD 30 are going to show us which rejection was the most important. Because in, in about A.D. 70, the Jews were completely dispersed by the Roman Empire and only a few left in the land. 
And the Romans made sure that those Jews couldn't return. So it's important to understand what's going on here. So here, are the, uh, here is the warning to the disciples, and I repeated the information that I quoted just a moment ago. And there is an exchange here that's often missed by the commentators. Jesus in Matthew 23 says, I reject you, and this is a paraphrase, and you are finished in the sight of God. Your house, that is the temple, is left to you desolate, in other words, the presence of God has left you until you decide to receive me. Judaism is a failed and dead religion. And if any of you who are listening are Jewish, I apologize, but this is not my word, but the word of Jesus, the Messiah. So the disciples, as Jesus leaves the temple for the final time, stop him and they say but master look how beautiful this place is and jesus just responds it doesn't matter the jewish leadership decided their own fate and that of the temple when they rejected me because they really want to be empty of god and his grace the final sign of that will be when the temple is destroyed and the remaining Jews are led captive and sold into slavery. Now, I'm embellishing here, but that's what happened at the end of the Roman siege in about 40 years. And this is why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He knew its coming fate and the fate of the Jews, and it broke his heart. The Jewish nation was dispersed by the Romans, and until 1948, they never had a homeland. Their sufferings have been legendary with persecutions and disasters. And by the way, Christians have participated in this, and they must not. The Bible is quite clear that we do not have the right to treat individual Jews as they have been. When we study Luke, we will see a bit more on this. But the disciples miss Jesus' point. And they ask him the next question. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And folks, for some reason, the disciples just don't get the implications of what Jesus said. But they do believe he is the coming king, which is true. So they ask to them, the next logical question is, when are you coming back? They don't anticipate he's going to be crucified, but this is his last few days, and he will be. Now, you'll notice that Jesus does not answer the first thing they ask yet. He waits until nearly the end of his sermon to say, but of that day and hour, no one knows. And remember that, because there have been so many people who have said, Jesus is coming back this year or next year or in the next five years, and they've always been wrong. We don't know. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he gives us a characterization of the time when these things will begin to occur. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And this is what I mean about all the tie-ins to the rest of Scripture. When we investigate what the days of Noah were, they were the days before the judgment of the flood wiped out the entire human population. And they were characterized this way in Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. It says, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The final days before the Lord's return will be like the days of Noah. And the characteristics of those days will repeat themselves. There will be a complete unawareness of what's coming. I mean, I'm, 
I'm watching YouTube videos about how the James Webb Telescope has discovered that the universe was not created by the Big Bang. Of course it wasn't. God created it. And the characteristics of all the days of Noah will repeat themselves. There will be a complete awareness of what's, unawareness, excuse me, of what's coming. Life goes on as usual. One of the other gospels says they'll be giving in marriage and, and living life as normally until, until, the beginning of the tribulation and then everything will fall apart. Violence and disobedience to God will characterize those days. Rejection of his son and more, of course. You'll see where this is going as it is happening in our generation. Things are becoming absolutely crazy. So here is the first admonition about Jesus' return. It says in Matthew 24, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will the sign of your coming be, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. That's his first statement. The very first thing he says is this will be a time of deception. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah, and they will deceive many. So if Jesus characterizes this time as a time of deception and says that it's the time of nearly universal confusion, it's characterized by many messiahs, that's to be expected. But now, back in the 1960s, we didn't really know that this deception is also characterized by a complete unmooring of much of society. And we see a great deal of, of it here in the West, but it's not only here. It's throughout all the nations of the world. And there is this wholehearted acceptance of insane beliefs and behaviors so it's more important than ever to hold fast to the word of God and the principles of our faith since Satan's aim is to flood the world of men with so much falsehood and confusion that we cannot distinguish right from wrong or intelligence from terminal stupidity. Folks, only the word of God can keep us safe from the deceptions that the world around us tries to tell us are right. And Christians are deceivable because the Bible is not so well known these days. And men and women are full of desires contrary to the word of God. And we are one or the other, of course, a man or a woman. The insanity that is characteristic of the last few years will get worse, not better. And only the word of God will give us right direction. I commend to you especially the first chapter of the book of Romans, which if you read it, will tell you all of the insanity that will come to pass because it was happening in the Roman society way back when. The pull of society is great, but it is inspired by Satan and the sinfulness of mankind. So please, read your Bible. Listen to what God says. Apply it in every instance. Believe only the truth and follow that. This is the first sermon on Matthew 24 and 25. More to come in a very short time. God bless you all. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off.